Today, my guest is Wojtek Vosetsky. Wojtek works for a non-profit organization called INSEAN, which is interested in innovative environmental solutions and strategy and management. Specifically, he's working on projects that will enable our transition from our linear economy to a circular economy. Wojtek, welcome. And tell us, why do we want to go towards a circular economy? What's in it for us? Well, thanks for having me here. I think it's quite straightforward, at least for me. Uh, today, as you said, we're living in a linear economy where, as it works, we uh, take resources, we make stuff out of it, products, and then we distribute them across the whole world and we consume them. And at the end of their life cycle, uh, they become waste. And uh, currently, only in the EU, for example, there's um, every year 2.5 billion tons of waste produced. But what we're seeing as well, that we're not so effective with working with the waste and recycling it, because from that 2.5 billion tons of waste in the EU, half of that amount is landfilled and incinerated. Circle Economy uh, proposes a healthy alternative to the current system by proposing a system where there's no waste, where waste equals resource, same as nature, where waste, the concept of waste doesn't exist. Okay, I get it, I get it. So waste is bad. Per se, waste is bad. I mean, uh, if we look at any natural system, there is no waste. Yeah, waste is stupid, I think. So um, if I'm thinking photosynthesis, how, how our planet captures sunlight, turns it into uh, chemical energy, if I'm thinking about the, you know, the, the flora and fauna which we have, everything has no waste, everything is recycled, everything is reused. So how did our economy in the first place get to this wasteful circumstance? Mm -hmm. Is waste a necessary part of the linear economy? Mm -hmm. Do we need waste to make us buy new things? Well, so not so long ago, humanity wasn't so waste producing um, entity. Uh, a few thousand years ago, there, I mean, we didn't even have so many products or types of materials that would become waste. And when they became waste, whatever we were using, I think humans were quite smart in finding ways how to still find a purpose for it. Where the academia thinks uh, that the things changed were after the Second World War, where uh, the economy needed to be started again and then um, the US and other Western countries started producing a lot of great stuff, also in large quantities. Uh, and uh, the idea was to get a fridge to every apartment, every house there is globally. So that's when the different age, let's say, of the linear economy and thus waste started. And so it's just getting worse. In our linear economy, we've got a, a beginning, a middle and an end. The end is the production of waste. The beginning is me owning something new. How important is ownership in this whole debate? Will ownership change when we go to a circular economy? Who will the fridge, the washing machine, the car belong to? Well, I think that it starts with uh, not the consumer who already buys like a finished product or, or service, but someone has to make it, take it and turn it into the product and then distribute it and sell it. So that has to be also taken into account. But you as a consumer, you, you play amazingly important part in that whole process. And, uh, and ownership is also amazingly important part of that process. Uh, and it's a big topic and big problem because um, what survey economy relies on is a transformation from the ownership, from having to own stuff, to offering service. Maybe you don't need a, a, a light bulb, you just need to use the light, right, as a service. Maybe you don't need a car, you just need to get from A to B. Um, but that kind of thinking, um, yeah, offers great but challenges. I think that kind of thinking particularly belongs to, you know, younger generations. Certainly I've read that there's studies suggesting that whereas people perhaps my age, a bit older, they want to own a car. They want their car, you know, the ownership. They, it's outside in front of their house every day. They can clean it, they can look after it. Whereas younger generations are thinking, I'm not interested about owning a car. I just need to go from A to B. I'm not interested about going to buy a new light bulb. That I just want, I want, to, I want to buy light. I don't want to buy the bulb, whatever. I can understand, I get that. So I can see this being a particular 
strong and, and have big potential for as young generations are coming through. Is that fair to say? I would think so, but at the same time, like when we were looking into some numbers in Czech and into purchase of textile, uh, the youngest generation were, were the heaviest purchases from H&M, you know, it's, it's also the young people that are driving this uh, current system forward. Uh, so, but at the same time, I think they're more open to innovative ideas and it's not so such a crazy thought for them to share car with someone and so on, rather in compare with someone who's been here for 80 years and is not interested in changing anything else anymore. Okay, so waste is going to be is going to be vital. Our management of waste is going to be vital. We need to find ways to take materials and keep them in the loop, so we can uh, we can be continually recycling and seeing them again in in uh, new products. So presumably that system makes sense, and yet so far it doesn't really exist. That must mean there's a costs involved. What according to you, what what costs are we going to have to absorb? What bitter pills will we have to suck to make the circular economy work? Well, right now, like uh, what the circular economy also relies on is using and working with what we have. That means, for example, using recycled content in new products that we are surrounded with. And sometimes uh, that comes with bigger price tag than if you source from virgin resources. So the one bitter pill, I would say, it's that uh, if you want to go for more sustainable, more circular product and you're not renting it, you want to still buy it, it could be more expensive than uh, some unsustainably sourced and produced product. And the other thing is, of course, the, the problem of the ownership. Like, um, I think that uh, in order to really have a successful model of the circular economy where materials are flowing in perpetual cycles without loss of quality, it has to be the producer who stays in charge of that material. That's why the change of ownership from the producer, from the customer to the producer. But the people are not really sometimes interested or maybe sometimes not ready for that. And what we're seeing from my own experience uh, by working here in Czech Republic is that um, sometimes you manage to push through like an ambitious pilot or a solution that can really change the whole industry. But uh, that change can be quite disruptive. And, uh, yes. and with disruption, there are some winners and there are some losers. Exactly. So the current system is fighting hard against these uh, strong changes. Exactly. I think this, what's exciting about this is that it's a true transition. We're looking at a big change. And change is often destructive. There's winners and there's losers. Uh, so who's going to be driving this change? Who's, is it going to be? Is it going to be me, the consumer? Is it going to be the the, the, the the company owners? Is it going to be governments providing incentives and tax breaks? Who's going to drive this, you know, groundbreaking change? I think that it's coming from all sides. It's coming from consumers, from citizens that want to see the change around themselves and are looking for the way to change their uh, uh, purchasing behavior. Uh, another thing is, of course, the companies themselves. For them, it's not just to look more sustainable. It's a huge business opportunity, a trillion dollar business opportunity, as Alan McCarter and McKinsey is once quoted in a study for the EU. So there's tremendous potential and, and profits to be gained from changing from the linear to the circular, with a lot of beta pills on the go, obviously. But uh, also the governments, they can play a huge role. So you can, you can work with one company here on making their products circular, but a one paper, one paragraph coming from Czech parliament can change the whole industry, the whole system. But, uh, and everyone needs to play their part in, in making this change happen. Where I see the biggest driver, it's the companies themselves. Okay. Well, can I, can I get a bit specific at one point? I, I'm particularly interested in, if we talk about certain materials, I'm particularly interested in plastics. That's because I'm, I'm a chemist, and uh, this is, a, this is a, a material which has incredible potential. It defines our current age in terms of materials. These are synthetic materials which we can design in the laboratory to give us new innovative um, properties that can, that can get all sorts of products going. And yet, what is 
we're particularly aware of at the moment is the problems with waste and recycling of this particular material. So I think the circular economy uh, gives us a, a lifeline to, to really make a difference in how we're treating this material. And one of the things I've certainly identified is that our perception of value in these materials, in these chemicals. So in the linear model, I believe that we, we see the value when we buy, we use the value, and then we throw away, we discard. Mm. And that means that we don't actually see the value at the end mm. after that use. The circular economy could help that. Could you tell me something about plastic as a material, how suitable that will be for the circular economy, and whether there are any people actually doing anything about this? Well, I think there's a lot of talk and maybe even hysteria around plastic and plastic pollution, rightfully so, because uh, 8 million tons of plastic end up in our ocean every year. And uh, we're seeing these pictures, you know, of like the pollution from all around the world. Yes. So clearly something has to change and something has to happen. But it's not just plastic. That's what we're telling everyone, you know, look around you. We are landfilling half of the waste that we throw in our black bins here in Czech Republic. It's two million tons of waste buried underground, leaking into our soils, into the atmosphere. So it's, it's not just plastics that are the problem. That, that's something we always say whenever we get this question. Um, what is happening right now, especially with the consumer plastics that we're busy with in the Czech Republic, is that uh, there's many types. It can be confusing for people to, to choose the right type of uh, a different plastic packaging, PE, PP, PET, and not just really for the consumers, but more for the recycling industry because well exactly because there's I mean there's different there's different types of plastics of course that's important mm -hmm. to say there's plastics which are very highly reusable uh, many forms of plastic go in that route but then there's problems with the single-use plastics mm -hmm. in particular with bottles I suppose that's the the sort of the flagship of of plastic waste so we're using these uh, PET bottles which are being discarded and we're losing their value when I was when I was a young kid I remember there was broken glass bottles everywhere until it went circular and people saw a value in recycling the glass. But now, now we're going to find a similar system, I think, for the, for the bottles. Do we, are there, are there any, is there any hope in that regard? Are there any people who are doing some interesting projects there? Yeah, it's, it's us. In fact, we're, we're working with the biggest PET bottle water producer here in Czech and Central Europe called Matoni, who approached us about a year ago uh, with that question of like, we are s selling around 600 million bottles just in Czech every year, single use, right? Which are lying around, uh, apparently have no value to anyone else after the consumer stuff's finished with it. What can we do? How can we be more circular? And uh, when we assess that uh, challenge, we figured the only way for a company like this to be circular, and it's quite an interesting way, is to set up a deposit system. Uh, you put an extra economic value on that material when a customer buys it, let's say three crowns extra when you go to shop and when you bring it back to a point of return you get that money back so in this way you're already solving one big problem with plastics and that's pollution mm. because when you when you have this not just voluntary incentive but an economic one uh, we're seeing that uh, in Germany 98 percent of the plastic bottles are returned back to the retail so that's, that's a, and, and that uh, remaining percent maybe is thrown into black bins or there's literally no, no litter from, from plastic bottles and other uh, deposited items. It doesn't have to be just plastic bottles. It actually makes sense both economically and environmentally. So this depository, this, this, this works different than from the yellow bins that we all know. So now at the moment, if I want to recycle, I crunch up, try to reduce the volume, find the nearest yellow bin, plastics, deposit. But now you're talking about something different. This is a depository specifically for a certain type, the, the, the PET bottle. Right. It's the same like people know already with the beer bottles, the glass refilled with beer bottles. Right. It's nothing new really for the Czech consumer. Uh, this time it's different because they've been taught to throw it into the yellow bin, maybe smash it. That hasn't been so successful. Like 40% of the plastic bottles transported in the yellow bins today are not smashed. So basically you're transporting air. Right. And, and then, uh, yes, so people know what the deposit is, they know it from the beer bottles, 
This time it will be for plastic bottles. And uh, the difference is that uh, what happens with it after you return it back to the retailer? Exactly, I get that. so I get my three crowns back, then mm. the bottle goes where? Goes back to the company. Ownership exactly. remains with the company. Exactly. Who produced it in the first place. And they, they clean and reuse? So the way it would work, just in theory, because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a concept that we proposed to Matone together with different clients and, and partners of ours, is that uh, it would get returned to retail, from retailer to uh, a facility where all these bottles would be baled into bigger bales and then sent for recycling. They get turned into PET flakes and regranulate. And of course, that regranulate can be used for whole lot of different purposes but the idea of our client was to use that material into the design of the new bottles so ultimately their goal is to collect up to 100% of the products they're putting on a market and using as much of that content back into the design of new bottles again and again and again and what do your economic models suggest will this come at a loss to the producers financial loss do they gain uh, is it is three three crowns per bottle enough to, to 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 I don't know to lubricate the circular motion of the bottle or what what's what's the you know when it comes down to the money how is it going to work? Uh, it's a good question. There's so many questions around the economic implications, the direct one, indirect ones. Uh, first of all, the, qu the question of the deposit, the amount of it. Will people return it when we added three crowns to it? The evidence from here shows that 95% uh, of beer refillable glass bottles get returned and the deposit is three check crowns. So we were uh, assuming that that amount shouldn't be significantly lower than that in case of the plastic bottles or cans. For the producers, there are definitely some investments involved at the start. They have to basically fund the whole system. The system funds yeah. itself from the material it collects and sells. Interestingly, it funds itself also from, I think, around 30% by the amount of the unredeemed deposits, what people buy and pay extra, but don't return back, don't claim the deposit back. And then the remaining percent, around 15% of the whole system would be funded by the producer fee for every bottle they put on the market. That would be the same as they're paying today for putting one ton of the PET on the okay. market with the current system. So what I'm hearing, I'm liking. I, I, I like, I, I value, as a chemist indeed, I value the properties of these plastic bottles. I like the idea of project which, projects which will instill in people's consciousness that there's value to this bottle even after you use it. We can recycle that, thus reducing waste, helping the environment. However, this transition will have knock-on effects to other partners in the whole sort of, uh, in, in that previous linear system, the producers of the plastic, and also current recycling uh, projects. Right. Presumably that's gonna change as well. So what happens to them? So that's the disruption that we've been discussing like a few minutes ago, right? Uh, I wouldn't be so worried about our primary plastics producers because the expectations are that the demand for plastic is gonna grow exponentially as it has been for the last few decades. Uh, the thing with the current system and especially the recycling and the waste management system is a bit different story because currently as it looks like it really heavily relies on the value of the PET. The PET bottles are driving the separation and recycling of the yellow bins and what's in them. And if you take it out, obviously there's not so much money to support collection and recycling of, of the remaining plastics in there. And there comes the first challenge which needs to be solved. We are afraid that uh, ultimately it will be the municipalities bearing these extra costs for the collection of the yellow bins and their so-called recycling. Uh, but we think it should be the producers that should redesign the plastic packaging in a way that it's valuable for to get recycled and get back to the system. But nevertheless, in your opinion, you feel there's a consensus throughout government, uh, private company and industry and consumers that the transition from linear to circular is the way to go forward. Whether it be glass, ceramic, plastics, paper, clothing, there's, there's all, even furniture I gather, there's a, 
there's now going to be quite a, a drive to look to, at ways to, to recycle uh, lots of furniture. So we're, we're, trans, we're gradually making that transition that can go throughout all our lives and materials. Well, I think if you, if you have a minute to explain the problems that we're facing today and, and offer them a solution in the sense of the circular economy, everyone agrees, always. I never had a conversation where I would be leaving and someone would tell me, oh, this, this is something that I don't believe in. Like, everyone knows something needs to change. And uh, after having a few minutes of discussion, I usually manage to convince people circular economy is the way forward. But that's just talking, right? And then we need action. And with action comes sacrifices, comes these bitter pills, comes these challenges, but also tremendous opportunities. Okay, so briefly maybe then tell us who's leading the way internationally. Because so far we've been talking about projects here in the Czech Republic. You mentioned the success uh, in Germany of recycling uh, drinking plastic bottles. So who else out there? What, how do we compare here in the Czech Republic to mm. our neighboring countries and elsewhere in the world? Well, a great example is the EU itself, which uh, a few years ago they, they said the circular economy is one of the top 10 priorities for mid-term and long-term development of the whole EU. So they even came up with a circular economy action plan, a lot of different targets for, for different, uh, different schemes, mostly waste. EU is doing great uh, in compare, for example, with China or US. China is huge on circular economy. It's huge. It's Because of course it's going to be important to get, we need the big beasts in the room. We need America and we need, we need the, the Far East, right? We need China, India to get into this thing. I mean, as far as I understand it, regarding a lot of waste and pollution is that it's coming from only a select number of rivers which are often passing through, in particular the Far East and Africa. Mm -hmm. So in the, the poorer countries, the problem is magnified and, and increasing. Uh, do you believe that the circular economy can outreach to these poorer, less well-developed uh, parts of our world? Oh, absolutely. But it has to go hand in hand with uh, setting, up exist setting up waste infrastructure, waste management infra infrastructure. The, the, the reason why there's so much waste and so much pollution is that these people don't have any means to to get rid of it but yet they are surrounded with the same products and same materials as we are here where the chances are that there's a bin on every corner that's just not but the then, way in but the then if, if the countries. plastic bottle gains a three crown value will that be international will it be necessarily limited to the czech republic can we can we can that value be universal in that case will there be a big incentive especially to poorer people, to really collect a lot of waste. Absolutely. And, and it's not just with the plastic bottles. You're seeing it with, with a lot of different commodities, like, for example, the recycling of e-waste in Africa. It's a huge topic. Or But then who's going to pay them? Because this is the problem. We're living in a, the, the pollution that we generate becomes a global problem. But then who pays for the recycling? Who's going who's gonna to pay the three crowns? Mm -hmm. If it's going to be in the Czech Republic, you buy a Czech bottle, I, I give it back in a Czech shop, I get three Czech crowns. It's understandable. But if that bottle floats out somewhere to the North Sea, then goes to the Pacific and ends up some, somebody picks it up, who pays them? Well, I can tell you that the way it has been so far, it's usually the municipalities, it's the villages, it's the cities that are in charge of their waste management and thus of uh, paying and funding this whole system. And sometimes they get a little money from the producers that usually unite in these schemes and, and, and different NGOs and associations. What needs to change, and it goes hand in hand with uh, this uh, change of ownership and retaining control of the material, using it back to the new products, the responsibility comes with it. So I think the trend is that the producers will need to take much bigger responsibility for what they're designing and putting on a the market. They have to think of not just how do I sell as many as possible, and I don't care about what happens afterwards, they need to start thinking, how do I get it back? How do I refurbish it? How do I use the content again and again and again? And, uh, and that, that's, I think, what, what will also help even in these developing countries, even in the case of the plastic bottles. Okay, Wojtek, well, uh, I wish you every luck in succeeding in convincing people to take ownership, take responsibility and make the circular economy happen. So thank you very much. Thank you.